if you look at the meteor data you, 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 and you look at subgroup analysis, patients who had visceral metastasis, bone metastasis, patients who had uh, you know, intermediate risk, poor risk, um, high tumor burden, uh, it's important to note that cabozantinib was shown to be superior to Evrolimus in all of these subgroup, uh, all these cohorts of patients. So I think one of the um, attractive uh, uh, scenarios where cabozantinib is particularly effective is in patients who have bone metastasis. And uh, we've seen that, and this is my experience, and this was born from the trial as well when we talk about Meteor. Uh, patients with bone metastasis are particularly vulnerable and traditionally have not had good outcome. And, but with cabozantinib, this is a scenario where cabozantinib is particularly uh, the go-to agent and uh, the drug that I would choose. If a patient has poor risk disease uh, in the salvage setting, and has bone metastasis. But you know, if they have also liver metastasis, they can respond as well with, from the, again, meteor data. Uh, I think you know, we have treated patients who are in their 70s uh, or even older uh, with cabozantinib. And the, the management of the adverse events is nothing different than you manage uh, the adverse events with a VEGF or TKI, such as pazopinib or sunitinib in the first line setting. So we manage with, uh, interruption for a few days to allow patients to uh, improve, allow those adverse events to resolve, and we manage with those reductions as well. And I start with 60 milligram. Like in this patient, we chose to start with 60, not 40, because she had progressive disease already progressed after two lines of therapy, including uh, nivolumab in the second line. And uh, it was important for us to deliver the 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 most powerful punch uh, against the cancer, and that's why I think important in my practice when a patient has spine metastasis, has liver metastasis, and they already their performance that's is declining, is to really go with the highest dose that's most efficacious. And then after they get a response, if, as in this case, they developed adverse events, that's when you can reduce the dose down to 40 milligram. Now, if you look at the Meteor data, the phase three trial we alluded to, the discontinuation rate due to adverse events was only 12%. Although the um, percentage of patients who required uh, those reduction was 60%. But again, management of adverse events with supportive care, as well as with brief interruptions, can uh, maintain a response and maintain a patient on therapy for uh, a good while. So I think in, in my experience, Cabozantinib is, a, is an effective agent in patients such as this lady with visceral and bone metastasis. In patients, if you look at also the Meteor data, 32 patients were previously treated with nivolumab. And there was, those patients responded as well to cabozantinib, and they had better response to cabozantinib over Everolimus. So we have experience. There is data to support the use of cabozantinib as second line and as well as third line, even if they had prior nivolumab therapy. So I could have chosen to treat this patient with uh, cabozantinib in the second line. That would have been appropriate as well. But the oncologist in the community chose to use nivolumab, and that's fine. But she could have received also cabozantinib as a second line, and then uh, nivolumab as third line or vice versa. I think it, it, we have now the uh, land of plenty. We have good news that we have many options for our patients, and many of our patients are receiving now third and fourth line, and at MD Anderson, we have patients who are receiving even seventh and eighth and ninth uh, lines of therapy. And that's good news for our patients. We have many options for them, and I think you know we can uh, tailor the therapy to the scenario and particulars of the patient situation. As you had mentioned, you know, performance status, age, comorbidities, and the sites of metastasis. The Meteor trial actually uh, did allow patients who had brain metastasis to get on trial as long as the brain metastasis were treated and controlled. So, and we have experienced that, uh, you know, it would be uh, appropriate to treat a patient with brain metastasis with a TKI as long as you have the brain metastasis under control, meaning they received stereotactic radiation, uh, or they had uh, surgery and resection of the brain metastasis, I think uh, it would be appropriate as long as you feel that the brain metastasis are controlled. There is no 
hemorrhage, there is no edema. So once you get the patient's brain metastasis under control, it's perfectly fine. And that's the, the uh, reassuring thing from Meteor is that they allowed patients who had brain metastasis as long as the brain metastasis were controlled. So I have no problem treating a patient with brain metastasis uh, or prior history of brain metastasis with cabozantinib. Now, do we know if somebody has brain metastasis and you give them cabozantinib, will the brain metastasis regress? I think that is still under investigation. We're looking at reward experience with uh, cabozantinib to see if a patient who has measurable or you know disease obvious on MRI of the brain, whether those will regress uh, with cabozantinib. Uh, and then I think this is something to be explored with immune checkpoint inhibitors as well as with uh, TKIs. We had reported in the past with sunitinib some of uh, some patients who had active brain metastasis, but not threatening, not associated with edema or hemorrhage that were small metastasis in the brain that actually responded to VGFR TKI. So that has been uh, my experience in the past. So it is uh, uh, appropriate to treat uh, patients who have uh, systemic disease and uh, brain metastasis with, uh, with a, a TKI such as cabozantinib.